وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وصل اللهم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله praise and blessings be upon the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alaihi wa sallam inshallah I wanted to go over a poem that uh, was written by Sheikh Abdullah Al Haddad radiallahu ta'ala anhu it's a poem it's very short and yet he really put into it all of the qualities that one needs to have success in this world and in the next. It is a poem of advice, counsel. It's a poem of counsel. And it was commented on by one of his students, and it's actually beautiful commentary, so I thought it was so beneficial. I wanted to share it with other people because I hadn't seen it before. I just recently, somebody was kind enough to bring me a copy from Hadramaut. And Hadramaut, as most of you know, is in Yemen is a place that the Prophet ﷺ blessed. It's also a place that became a refuge for a lot of the Prophet ﷺ's family when they were being persecuted in Iraq. Many of them actually fled to the Yemen and many fled to Morocco and many fled to India, which is why you have very large numbers of al bayt in places like India, Yemen, and Morocco. It's disproportionate to other parts of the Muslim world and it has to do with the fact that those were places where the family actually sought refuge. And obviously one of the reasons that they sought refuge was because Beni Umayyah basically set out to eliminate the family of the Prophet ﷺ because they were so worried about the political implications of charismatic figures from among them. It was a major concern of theirs because this was obviously the initial split that occurred between the Muslims was where does authority lie? And many of the Muslims took the opinion that authority lied in the family of the Prophet ﷺ and that many of them became the party of Ali or Shi'atu Ali. Now we disagree with the uh, Shia on one particular which is that we actually believe that the authority that the Prophet ﷺ's family were given was a spiritual authority. In other words, that from many of the family would come some of the greatest scholars of Islam and some of the greatest spiritual guides. But the Prophet ﷺ informed the community early on that political sovereignty and spiritual sovereignty would separate and he actually gave a very exact date and he said it would happen 30 years after his death وسلم, and that occurs with the death of Hassan bin Ali at that point the political authority became political and was severed from the spiritual reality and that is in no way to detract from Sayyidina Muawiyah but Muawiyah was a political leader and the people that were under him were, were political more than spiritual. And that is why his period of Khilafah is not considered from the Khulafa al-Rashidim, which does not mean that he wasn't rightly guided. It has to be understood. It's just that his political authority became divested of the spiritual authority that the first four Khulafa had. So that's the difference. And a lot of people don't understand that. And it becomes a problem because if you study the early history, the early history is actually quite complicated and it's been simplified by scholars because it causes so much trouble when people actually read about what happened because it's very hard to understand how Sahaba could have started killing each other. It's very difficult to understand how people that were actually in the presence of the Prophet ﷺ could start fighting over political authority. But that shows you how central that issue was early on. Now, what happens, and this is something that is absolutely necessary to understand today, which a lot of Muslims, I feel, really don't fully understand. 
And that is the idea of having an absolute separation between spiritual reality and political reality. And the reason for that is that when the spiritual and the political become mixed up, the political denudes it or removes from it its reality. And so what you have is state-controlled religion. And state-controlled religion is always a disaster. It's always been a disaster. And it will always be a disaster until a prophet comes or the student of a prophet. And that's why the students of the Prophet ﷺ were very adept at doing that for especially Sayyidina Abu Bakr and Omar because of the gifts that they had been given. I mean, they were the Shaykhan and the Prophet ﷺ made it very clear that Omar anhu that if there was a prophet after the Prophet ﷺ would have been Omar. In other words, his ability to perceive things was so extraordinary that even in the most difficult circumstances he was able to come up with remarkable solutions for them. So that's important to note, which does not mean that we don't want political leaders to have ethics or morals or we just don't want them to be mullahs or ulama because once that happens they have to compromise that's the nature of politics politics is the ground of compromise it's not the ground of principle religion is the ground of principle and if you want the biggest proof for this ask yourselves why every great scholar fled from government service in the history of Islam I mean, you have to ask yourselves that why did Abu Hanifa prefer jail over becoming a civil servant. Why? If he understood that to be in a political position was a good thing for a righteous man, then he would have been the first to do that because he would have felt that responsibility. Why then did he, as a spiritual and religious leader, flee from political leadership? Because he knew what it meant. Nobody's ever pleased with their politicians. It's just the human condition. And even the munafiqun grumbled in Medina. Nobody is ever pleased with their politicians. And once the spiritual person becomes a politician, it's the spirituality that suffers, not the politics. It's the spirituality that suffers. So these people who fled to Hadramaut, many of them actually became great scholars, and that is where you get the Ba'alawi tradition. And that's what Sheikh Al-Haddad was part of that and also it has continued up to the present day they have schools they have traditions but within their tradition there is a complete Islamic system in other words they have fiqh they have Arabic texts they have texts in logic they have texts in usul everything including the science of ihsan and the same is true for instance of Morocco the same is true for Turkey the same is true for Pakistan the same is true for Mauritania I mean, Mauritania, you can study the entire Islamic tradition from beginning to end only reading Mauritanian scholars, with the exception, obviously, of the Nusuls, the Quran, the Hadith. Those are givens. But I'm talking about Usul. Sidi Abdullah ibn Hajj Ibrahim wrote the book of Usul that's studied in Mauritania, which is his versification of Jam al Jawami of Imam Subki. So when you study usul in Mauritania, you study his. When you study hadith, mustarahat al-hadith, you study qar'at al-anwar, which is from Sidi Abdullah ibn Hajj Ibrahim. He versified al-Iraqi's famous book, al-Alfiya. When you study grammar, you'll study commentaries of the Mauritanian grammarians on the classical text. So that's one of the unique aspects of Islam. Wherever it goes, it develops an intellectual tradition that's indigenous to the people. And it actually ends up becoming complete in and of itself. And this has yet to happen in the West, but it has to happen. In other words, we have to develop within our Western Muslims, we have to develop the Islamic tradition. It has to be here. And the text that we use and the the language that we speak in has to be indigenous to the people. That's part of Islam, wherever it goes. One of the ulama said that Islam is like water, but the vesicle that contains it has a coloring. So the Islam is pure, but it takes on the color of the vessel. So in Senegal, it has a certain color. In Indonesia, it has a certain color. And that's why when you see it, it's different. In Afghanistan, it's different. So every place it goes, it's the same water that has nourished the people, but it takes on its own coloring. 
And that's part of the universality, because if we were all meant to become Arabs, then that's a disaster. And it's nothing against Arabs, but it's just not what Allah wanted for human beings, all to become Arabs. I mean, people say, why don't you speak Arabic to your children? I say, because it's not my mother tongue. Their tongue is English. That's where I grew up, and that's the language. For me, Arabic is a religious language. That's why I learned it. I didn't learn it to talk to Arabs, to have conversations, to say, come at the matum, you know, how much are the tomatoes? I mean, you can buy tomatoes here. You don't need to go to Arabia. To, in fact, they came from here. When we study, we should study for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why Islam has to be freed of any cultural apparatus. It has to be freed of that, Islam. It doesn't mean that Islam doesn't adapt to the culture that it's in, but Islam in and of itself has to be seen as being free of that. So he wrote this as a counsel and really just put everything that was needed for the purification of the self in it. So it's similar, it's more abridged than say the Mathara, but it really does contain an incredible amount of wisdom in it. And all of these texts share similarities because they're largely derived from Imam al-Qushayri, Imam al-Ghazali, Abu Talib al makki Imam al-Junaid. The founding teachers of the science are the same, and so they're all deriving from those sources. So he begins, وَصِيْتِ لَكِ يَادَ الْفَضْرِ وَالْأَدَبِ إِنْ شَئْتَ أَنْ تَسْكُنَ السَّامِ مِنَ الرُّتَبِ My advice to you, O possessor of fadl and adab, if you desire to reside in an exalted place amongst the ranks of people, a place where you are high and exalted. So he begins by saying wasiya, and the wasiya is counsel. It's an advice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that He wasayna alladhina min qabrikum wa iyyakum an ittaqullah that we have counseled those who went before you and you yourself to have taqwa. So that's called the wasiya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's the advice of God is to have taqwa. And the wasaya al ashara are the famous Ten Commandments. So it can also be seen as a type of principle that somebody should follow. And so he's giving counsel. And it's to you, Ya dal fadri wal adabi. Counsel only benefits people that are willing to accept it. If you give counsel to somebody who is a vile person, they won't accept your counsel. One of the things that the poet and Mutanabi said, in al karima ida akramtuhu maraktuhu that noble people, if you're good to them, you possess them. In other words, if you do a good to somebody who's noble, it's a type of possession because he feels indebted. It's the nature of good people. If you do good to them, they feel indebted. But he said, but if you do the same to a vile person, he becomes angry, resentful, which is very interesting about human nature, that there's people that become resentful because you've treated them well. And so that's what he's arguing. He's arguing that I'm giving it to you. Why? Because you're somebody who has fadl, which is virtue, and you have adab. And these are two really important words in the Islamic tradition. Because the Prophet ﷺ is somebody who taught makarim al-akhlaq, which are the fadail. He taught makarim al-akhlaq. He said, innama bu'ithtu li utammima makarim al-akhlaq. I was only sent to teach people virtuous character, noble character, the makarim. And these are called the fada'il. And the fada'il tradition, according to Qadi Abu Bakr ibn al-Arabi, he said, all of virtues are reduced to four. The first is courage. The second is temperance. The third is prudence and the fourth is justice. Those are called the moral virtues. All virtues are extensions of one of those four. So for instance, generosity is a virtue. Out of those four, which would it really be classified under? Courage. Because generous people are courageous people. Because what prevents you from being generous? It's fear. You're afraid that if I give him this thing, I'm at loss. 
If I give him this money, I won't have any money. So it's only fear that prevents you from being generous. So generous people are actually courageous people. They're courageous with their money. Now, chastity, which is also a virtue, what would that go under? Temperance. Any virtue that you can think of that's a moral virtue, you can find it categorized under one of those four virtues. And the Prophet ﷺ, he was the most courageous of men, which meant he was also the most generous of men. So he was not only courageous in battle, but he was courageous in wealth. Now look at the Quran. What does the Allah link in the Quran? In Allah Allah has purchased yourself and your wealth. Both of them are expenditure, infaq. So both of them are expenditure. You have to expend your wealth and you have to expend yourself. And those are both acts of courage. He's talking to the one who already has virtue. You have to have some fadl in order for you to recognize virtue. Because if you are bereft of that, then you don't. Now also you have to have adab because advice is only given when you're receptive to it. Now there are people that if you give them advice, they get angry at you. Why do they get angry? Well, there's a number of reasons. One of the reasons they get angry is simply they think, you know, who do you think you are to be giving me advice? So what does that mean? That person feels one of two things. Either you're beneath him or you're equal to him or her and therefore you have no right. But if you see somebody actually as being better than you, you'll take their advice. And that's why people look to people that they think are, in this culture, more together. You know, I'll go ask him because he's got his act together, as opposed to me, I'm a mess. So this is what people do, which is, in this culture, one of the things that they do is people go to psychiatrists, and I guarantee you that the reason people get interested in psychiatry is almost invariably because they're deeply disturbed people. They're actually trying to work out themselves, and they often have real serious problems. I mean, that's not everybody, but I'm talking about a lot of people, and that is why if you study the statistics about psychiatrists and the number of illicit relationships that they get into with their clientele, things like that, you're dealing with people that are not prepared to really be giving counsel. If things like that happen, something's very seriously wrong, there's a breakdown. So when you give advice, one of the things about adab, and this is really interesting to me, adab is the ability to know the place of things and to give things their proper due. So it's really translated as comportment or a type of discipline in which you recognize where things belong. And part of recognizing where things belong is to recognize where you belong in relation to social hierarchies. I mean, one of the things that this culture almost never talks about, it talks about civil rights a lot, or human rights, but it rarely, in fact, I don't think it's ever mentioned the idea of social rights. Is your right to have equality in society? You see, because that's a quote-unquote ideal of democracy. People are equal, but in fact, they're not. In this culture, it's very clear that there are social hierarchies. And if you fall at the bottom of one, woe unto you if you try to crash the party of a higher rank in society. So social rights are never talked about. In the Islamic tradition, one of the really interesting things about Islam is it teaches us that there is an internal hierarchy that is known only to God. And therefore, it challenges you to recognize that everyone outside yourself may be better than you in the eyes of God. And so you have to have comportment with everybody, even a person that you might think is lower in social standing, they could be higher in spiritual standing. And this is why you had kings at the doors of beggars in the history of Islam. There's no other religion that I know of that has that quality, where you had literally kings at the doors of beggars asking for their prayers. The other thing that is really interesting is in this culture, you won't get people from Black Hawk or from Los Gatos 
going to church in East Oakland. It's just not the way the society works. And yet in the Muslim world, the richest man could pray next to the most impoverished man in the same prayer line. And it's always been like that. And that is something really unusual about Islam, is it creates a true brotherhood. There's a recognition that people have things in the world that Allah has given them and other people lack, but that does not prevent you from seeing this person as essentially equal before God and possibly, and in fact probably, according to most of the hadith about rich people and poor people, the poor person is probably closer to God than you are. And that instills in you a desire to actually be kind to them. Because you're actually worried that you might upset your Lord by having any contempt or even just simply treating them less than they deserve. This is the secret of adab. And that is why our tradition is a tradition of adab. And the adib in Arabic is the one who has mastered language. It's what they call a literary person. An adib is a literary person. Why? Because the adib is the one that puts words in their proper place. The adib is the one that learns language. And this is something that if you look at modern man and modern woman, we are a very degraded creature because we don't speak proper language anymore. I'm talking about English, Arabic, Chinese, Japanese, the whole lot of us. There's very few people on the planet that know how to actually speak properly, that really understand the mechanics of language and what words go in what order and for what purpose. And it, traditionally in the Muslim world, in Arabia at the time of the Prophet everybody knew how to speak. They didn't know how to write, they didn't know how to read, but they knew how to speak. And that's why when the Qur'an spoke to them, it spoke to them in their language. And so they knew what kalla meant. If Allah said kalla, so fata'lamun. They knew exactly what kalla meant. When Allah said la ilaha, not la ilahun illallah. They could have been la ilahun illallah, but it was la ilaha illallah. So when Allah said la ilaha illallah, they knew exactly what that meant. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said attaqullah, they knew what taqwa was, they understood what it meant. And this is something that's been lost. So he's talking to a person that has virtue and comportment, adab. In shi'ta an taskuna sami min al-rutab, if you really want to be exalted. Now this exaltation that he's talking about is not in the eyes of others. It's in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because there are people that concern themselves with rank in the dunya. These are ahl dunya and one of the signs of Ahlul Dunya traditionally, in the, I'm talking about in the Muslim world, one of the signs traditionally of the people of the dunya were people that concerned themselves with those things that would ensure social ranking. They would ensure social ranking, that they would ensure that they would be upwardly mobile, and that was their obsession. Well, for the people of Akhira, their concern was that they were internally upwardly mobile, not externally that their standard of living was not increasing. They weren't concerned about their standing of living, but they were concerned about their standard of conduct with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what they were concerned about. Were they living up to the standard that Allah had set for them? Because Allah has set a standard for humanity in behavior. And that was their concern. Were they living to, up to that standard? That was their desire to raise their standard of spiritual living, not their standard of material living. And we're now living in a world where the standard of material living is literally the only one that people perceive anymore. And therefore, increasingly, in order to achieve that, people will be remiss in their standard of ethical behavior. They will actually neglect principled standards in order to achieve that external standard. And then he says that وَتُدْرِكَ السَّبْقَ وَالْغَيَاتِ تَبْلُغُهَا مُهَنَّأً وَتَنَالَ الْقَصْدَ وَالْأَرَبِ In order for you to be in this forefront, to outstrip, to go ahead, and to achieve the ghaya, and the ghaya is, traditionally, it originally came from a word which meant the flag, the standard, the idea of 
the standard bearer was always out front. And it became a metaphor for achieving an end. So a raya is originally a raya, a flag, but it came to mean to achieve an end. If you want to achieve this end and to reach it in this state of felicity and to achieve your goals and desires, then what is his advice? Taqwa Allah, taqwa ilah. That's the advice he's giving, taqwa ilah. Now taqwa is an amazing word in Arabic because it comes from a very small group of words which have weak radicals on both ends, waqiya, and its root meaning is to protect or defend. And wiqaya is the word that the Arabs use for prevention, to prevent something from happening. So the Arabs say a penny of prevention is better than a pound of treatment. So it's more intelligent to prevent illness than to wait until it happens and then have to suffer treatment. What he's recommending here to us is taqwa al-ilah, alladhi turja marahimuhu, the one who we desire his graces, the compassion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, al-wahid al-ahad al-kashafi lil-qurabi, the unique, the single, the remover of all calamity. So that's what he's saying. This is the foundation of all advice. And this is from the Qur'an directly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qū anfuskum wa ahlikum nara. Save yourselves. Same root word. Qū, save yourselves. And save your families from the fire. Now how do you do that? I mean, how do you save your families? First of all, the way you save yourself, and that's important because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Qū anfusukum. Now we usually think Allah save us. But Allah is telling us, save yourself. I mean, it's very interesting if you think about that. We usually think of Allah save us, but Allah is saying to us, save yourselves. Now, why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be saying that to us? Because only Allah can save us in reality. I mean, the Prophet sallallahu said that no one would get into paradise because of his actions. And they said, what about you, Ya Rasulullah? What about not even you, O Messenger of God? And he said, not even me unless Allah immersed me in His mercy. Now that doesn't mean that this is simply you go to paradise and you go to hell. I mean, that's not the way it works. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, save yourselves and your families from the hellfire, what He is telling us is, I've given you all of the means for salvation and you have to use them because if you don't, you haven't allowed me to save you. And this is the idea, if you go to a physician and the physician gives you a medication, why did you go to the physician? To be cured. What did you think you were gonna get from the physician? A cure. Well, he gave you a cure, but it wasn't what you expected. You thought he was gonna give you a pill and you just had to take it every morning and you would spontaneously get better. But he told you you had to start exercising every day. He told you you had to stop eating fats. He told you you had to give up sugar. He told you you couldn't smoke anymore. So he gave you a list of things to do. And then six months later you come back and nothing's changed. In fact, things are worse. And then the doctor says, what happened? Didn't you take my advice? I found it so difficult. Well, here's the choice. Don't take my advice and keep getting worse and then see what's more difficult, losing your health completely or taking my advice. And the aql is the one who thinks things through. He goes to the end. <laughs> Don't they reflect about the Quran in a deep way? Tadabbur in Arabic, dubar is the end of something. You have qubal and dubar, the front and the back. Yatadabbar means to force yourself to the end of something. So it's taking something to its logical conclusion. So if, for instance, you don't like to exercise, which at 30 is not really a problem, but at 40 it becomes a problem, and then at 50 it's getting very serious, and by 60 you're immobile. So the person who at 30 was thinking about 
what's it going to be like when I'm 60 if I don't do something about this? That's just an intelligent person. It's not a genius. It's just somebody who's looking around at others and noticing this person, he's 60 and yet he's fit and he's got energy and he's doing all these things. And this other person, he's been smoking, now he has to go around with a canister. He's walking around with a canister or he's in a wheelchair or he's on a ventilator. And that's just looking at, that doesn't mean the fitness and all these things is going to guarantee because there's no guarantees in anything in life other than that we're all going to die. But the point is, is that there are asbab in the world. Now, if you look, for instance, at people that are filled with ma'asiyah and dissipate themselves, they expend all of their energies in ma'asiyah, you will notice that by the age of 25 or 30, there is a darkness that has descended upon their faces. Ahlul ma'asiyah. See, young people, whether they're Muslim or non-Muslim or whatever, young people have a light. And that light is simply the fact that they have not accrued a lot of wrong actions. That's why if you see dark young people, you know something seriously wrong. But there is a light in youth that is simply the vigor of youth. And it's also the fact that young people have not accrued a lot of wrongs. If you look at children, it's stunning. Why are people so attracted to the faces of little children? Because they see innocence. Why is that innocence there? Because there's no wrong actions. So you're attracted to purity by nature. And that attraction in really sick people is what causes these problems in this culture. And it's a problem in the Muslim world as well. Because that attraction becomes sick. Because there's platonic attraction. There's people that are attracted to virtuous people. That's their nature. There's people that are attracted to those people. But shaitan, nafs, hawa, dunya, they like their portion in attraction. And so they will attempt to take something that's pure and defile it. That's the nature of the dunya, is defilement. It's what the people of Ihsan call kudurat. It's the kudurat of dunya. You kaddiru. Kaddara in Arabic means to stir up the mud at the bottom of a pond. You have a clear pond, limpid, easy to look down and see the bottom. But if you muck up the bottom, then you stir up all of that dirt. Well, that's the nature of the soul, that if you allow these ma'asiyah to be stirred up, they will eventually muddy the purity of the self. Because we are made of mud, and it's our nature, but we're also made of spirit. So whichever one's dominating is the one that's going to show itself. And this is why the light of the aged is, it's not youth. And the darkness of the aged is disobedience. Absolutely sound principle. So if you look out there, I mean, I wanted to do just an experiment where you took all of the pictures of our awliya, our people, righteous people, and then just put pictures of all the old people in the dunya and just show the faces, just show the faces and let people see for themselves which group they want to be among when they get old. And this is not about knowledge even, because you can see faces of purity in villages amongst the simplest people. And one of the things about us that should prevent us from any type of arrogance or spiritual superiority is that most of us are not even practicing the Islam of the most common people in the villages of the Muslim lands. I mean, if you go to Mauritania, I can show you people that nobody in Mauritania thinks anything of. And they do a juz of Qur'an every morning and every night. They do the ma'thurat of the Prophet every morning and every night. They fast the three days of the month, every month. They give whatever little sadaqah they have to give, which is a lot more than what most of us do, because for him, a quarter is like $100 to us or more. And this is an ammi, it's just a simple Muslim. Nothing special there. So that's the type of age we're living in when people that do a little start thinking that they really are something. Part of having taqwa is that you don't fall into those traps because the self by its nature is deceptive. It's constantly trying to deceive you. I mean, it's the nature of the self. The self is delusional. And there's a psychology of self-delusion which is very interesting 
and worth reading. And I would recommend for people that are interested in this, and I think everybody should be interested in it, I would recommend reading Daniel Gorman's book called Simple Truths, Vital Lies, The Psychology of Self-Deception. Because one of the things that he points out in there is that groups are completely delusional. Groups enter into delusional states. And individual delusion is actually less dangerous than group delusion. Because once groups become delusional, it's very difficult to break it. So we're living in a country that's in a delusional group state. We live in a country, people are in a delusion, a group delusion, about how they perceive themselves in terms of what they're actually doing, what we are actually doing, we. I mean, I'd like to say that I'm not part of all this, but I am. And so for me to set myself outside of it is really the height of arrogance. What we are doing here, what we as a people are doing collectively, and we're in a delusional state. The Muslims are in a delusional state, complete delusional state. So groups become very delusional. And if you study the Quran, and I would do this as an exercise, read the Quran one time as an exercise. If you don't read Arabic, read it in English as an exercise in looking at group delusional states. And what you will find is every single prophet was an individual that confronted a delusional group. Every single one of them. It's one individual going up against a deluded group. And they always want to kill him. I mean, that's the thing about groups. If you're not with us, you're against us. And that is a delusional state because nothing in this world works like that. That is Manichaean. It's actually a theological fallacy that was rejected by the Christians through St. Augustine and by the Muslims through Abul Hassan because the Muslims called them the Qadariya. And that was an early group in Islam, the Qadariya, who put everything black and white. There's good and evil. I'm good, therefore you're evil. That's the way it worked. And it's not like that. If it was like that, we wouldn't have to face the evil in ourselves. And what Raghub Isbahani says is that anything that you see in other people is actually either manifest in you clearly to other people looking at you or is hidden in you like fire in flint. In other words, given the right situation, it'll come out. Because as he is human, you are human. And that's why once you start realizing that, you become less judgmental about people out there. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ, what did he say? I was commanded to judge outwardly. I don't judge people's hearts. It's not my business. Only God can do that. So if I see somebody do something wrong, I can condemn the outward action. The inward reality, I don't have any authority over it. It's not my business. Because I don't know. There's too many variables. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can work that out. So he's saying that this is at the essence of this teaching, is to have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in many verses of the Qur'an, mentions that. And the first commandment in the Qur'an is, Ya ayuhan nasa taqwa rabbukum. That's the very first commandment. If you read Surah Al-Baqarah, the first commandment that you come to in the Quran is have taqwa. And it's to all of humanity. The first degree of taqwa is taqwa al-kufr. And that is why when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَسِعْتَ رَحْمَةِ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ وَسَأَكْتُبُهَا لِلَّذِينَ يَتَّقُونَ My mercy has encompassed all things and I have decreed it for the people of taqwa. If that only meant the idea of taqwa that you and I think of when we think of taqwa, then we would all be lost. But that taqwa includes, by the mercy of Allah, the taqwa of kufr, which every muwahid enters into. Every muwahid is a muttaqi, because he has fear of kufr. He doesn't want to associate with Allah. Now even because Allah is merciful, and this is something to think about, Imam al-Ghazali's position, which seems to me, it just seems to be the one that seems the fairest. And that's why he obviously, I think, expounded it. He felt that this included people that had not been shown shirk to understand it. So as long as the people had not been really shown and explained what they were doing wrong, they weren't accountable for it. 
which is closer to the understanding of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah's mercy is and that also is consistent with the verse in the Quran which is the first prohibition mentioned in the Quran wala taj'alu lillahi andadan wa antum ta'lamun do not set up idols with God once you know wa antum ta'lamun once you know so before that, ma kunna mu'adhibina hatta nabatha rasulah. We don't punish people until they are given knowledge. And once they're given knowledge, then they're held accountable, responsible for that knowledge. Prior to that, we don't believe there's accountability, although there is a khilaf about that in aqidah. And the dominant position in the Muslim world, which the majority of Muslims follow, is the position actually that there is intellectual accountability. In other words, that even if people are never given a message, they're accountable for what in the West is called natural law. In the West, there's a belief that there is a natural law. And this is what the founding fathers of the United States, when they said, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator. How did they do that? They didn't use recourse to revelation in that text. What they meant was in natural law, it is discernible that people have rights given from their creator. One of them is life. So every human being, in essence, understands that he has been given life and really doesn't have the right to take life from another. So according to Abu Mansur al-Maturidi, according to his people, people would be held accountable for murder even if they had never been given a message. That's a position, and I personally incline towards that just naturally because I think that it, it's not the position of what Hassan's people. They actually feel that you're not accountable until you're actually given a message of revelation because of the nature of the intellect. It's too clouded and it can't work out things. So what then is taqwa? The first level of taqwa is taqwa al-kufr. The second level of taqwa is taqwa al-kabair that you're actually fearful of major wrong actions with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What are the kaba'ir? There's difference of opinion about that. But generally, Imam al-Dhahabi wrote a book and he's got over 70. And most of the ulama say that it's just too much because people would be held to account for far too much. Some of the ulama say that there are only the seven that are mentioned in the, what are called the seven deadly sins in Islam, which are different from the seven Christian deadly sins. But the dominant opinion is that they are those sins that you have performed and a specific punishment has been given in the Sharia for them, a specific punishment. In other words, either worldly or otherworldly, where it's very clear that whoever does this, this happens. So there's an uquba associated with it because there are certain things where we're not told clearly what would be the effect of that and those go under the category of sagair or the lesser sins although ibn abbas and others were of the opinion that any sin that was continuous enters into the realm of enormity kabira simply because a person they don't have contrition or remorse for that sin means that their hearts bereft of real taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So taqwa is ja'lu nafsi fi wiqayat al-shara' wa ma yahfaduha min al-aswa'i fi al Taqwa is putting the self in the protection of the sanctity of the law, the sharia, and what protects it from evils in both abodes. In other words, in this world and the next. So that's the definition of taqwa. It is placing the self in the protection of the sacred law and in what protects it from the evils of the two abodes. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in al mudathir huwa ahlu taqwa wa ahlu al He is worthy of being guarded against. In other words, his wrath. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ahlu taqwa. He is worthy of taqwa. It's a right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we actually have taqwa. And also, he's worthy of maghfirah. In other words, if you have taqwa, then what you expect is maghfirah for your shortcomings, because everybody falls short. And so that's from the mercy of Allah. So what we're being told, basically, is that if you do these things, then you will be forgiven. So that gets back to who saves us? Who saves us? We save ourselves. Quwam fusukum. But... 
We only save ourselves by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when Allah commands us to save ourselves, He's not saying something that is meaningless. He means very much, Qu anfusukum, guard yourselves against a fire. Save yourselves. Guard yourselves and your family. Now how do you guard your family? Ibn Abbas said, and to allimuhum wa to adibuhum, that you teach them and you give them adab. And the adab of the sharia is taqwa. That is the adab. That's the comportment of the sacred law, is to have taqwa. So one of the definitions of taqwa is a taharruz min al-makhawif wa tashmir fil wadaif. It is to guard oneself against those awesome matters that should put fear in your heart. And also to roll up your sleeves in the work of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, the wadaif. I mean, it's an interesting word because wadifa now in modern Arabic means employment. So muwadhaf is an employee. But in classical Arabic, in the technical vocabulary of the ulama, the wadaif were those things that one did in order to draw near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So again, if you look at people in this world, why are they in the wadaif, in their employment? in order to raise their standard. Why are the people of Allah in their wadaif? In order to raise their station with the living. I mean, that's the difference. So, taqwa is the foundation of the path to God. And some of them said it's four matters. Iqamat al-fara'il, it is to fulfill the obligations. Wishtinab al-maharim, I mean, that's what Ibn Ashir that the summation of it is doing what Allah commanded you and avoiding what He prohibited you inwardly and outwardly. So that's what He's saying. It's doing the fara'id and avoiding the prohibitions. sunnah and to follow the sunnah walizum al adab. Because this is an important aspect. You see the adab. I mean, I'll give you an example. I was in a situation where somebody did something which was a gross breach of adab. And I mentioned that. It had to do with culture and the adat. I mean, for instance, in Arab culture, you do not walk up to a woman and propose to her. I mean, you just don't do it. Now, is there anything in sharia that says you can't do that? I mean, does it say in sharia it's haram to propose to a woman? No, it's actually mandub to propose to a woman. So where then does the adab come in? It comes in how you do the proposal. And that is part of the sharia. And this is something a lot of, especially modern Muslims, I mean, that's a whole word in itself, modern Muslim. Because modern Muslims have a whole other understanding of Islam to the point that many of the early Muslims would pull out their hair if they saw the behavior, or worse, worse. And I'll tell you a true story. I know a Moroccan man who was on a bus with, I mean, sharrul bariya ma yadhik, like the Arabs say, the worst calamities are things that make you laugh. This man was on a bus, and the bus had all of these people from the desert, village people, living in the de very pure people. I mean, I lived with them, I know. And they drove into Agadir for the first time, and they saw all of these tourists that were basically naked, and he said they all started screaming. And literally, they couldn't believe it. They just went into a total state. And he said it was one of the most powerful things, because he'd gotten used to it. But it was the first time they'd ever seen it, and they just went into this state like they thought it was some end of time. It was all something happened that was terrible. And they all started screaming. And he, for the first time, he told me he realized how enormous it was. So adab is something that we've completely lost. I mean, we really have forgotten about adab. Now, there's obviously adab can go to another extreme, which is where you get into protocol. And that's a whole other problem because it goes to the other extreme where the culture becomes so inundated with the particularities of adab that you no longer have freedom. I mean, you breach adab in the tradition. That's why I always stipulate with some of the ulama that I'm Amriki, Hamaji. You know, I'm just a primitive American. So you have to allow some leeway 
Because in the traditional Muslim world, if you spend time with the ulama, there's a real expectation of certain comportment, which is now only in places like Yemen and some places in Morocco, some places in Syria and Sudan and places. But it's been lost in a lot of places. I mean, people don't have that understanding anymore. The, I mean, if you read the early stories about the awe, I mean, I finished this edit of Imam al-Dara'i's biography, who wrote Du'a Nasiri. And I'm going to tell you this a true story, because I wrote it in the thing. We recorded the Du'a Nasiri in Fez, and we finished at about one in the morning, and nobody knew I was in Fez except these people. And somebody had given me a hundred dollars to give to somebody in Fez. And we went out, we had dinner, and it was about 3.30 in the morning, and we had to go to Tangiers. And as we were driving up the hill, I said to this man, Muhammad bin Nis, I said, you know, I have a, an amana, a trust, for so-and-so, and I'm not going to be able to see him because we just had to leave so quick. We had a flight from Tangier, I was with Abdul Latif Whiteman. So I said, can you give it to him? And he said, Bismillah, yeah, I'll give it to him. Just as I said that, he said, SubhanAllah, I think we just passed him. Right? It was 3.30 in the morning. So he said, go back. So we drove back. And he was standing in front of a white van without any windows. He didn't know I was in Fez. And he said, when he saw me, he said, SubhanAllah. He said, we just finished a khatam of the Qur'an and I made dua that I'd see you tonight. <laughs> now we had just finished the dua al Nasiri. He opened the door of the van. There was about 20 of his people in there because they do khatam and dara al khirat and they do a lot of things. And he went like this, Bismillah. And he went down and they all broke into dua al Nasiri. And they recited it from beginning to end. True story. You know, believe it or not, I don't care. <laughs> so Allah does those things. I call on the shore of unseen oceans. You see, because if you look out at the ocean, why do people look at the ocean? It's much more interesting usually what's to their back, right? The land. Because you can see all these plants and trees and flowers and... But why do they look out at the ocean? It's the same thing. What's that awe in us when we look at the ocean? Part of it is what's under. It's all that stuff that's hidden from us. And if you wait long enough, you'll suddenly see this fish jump. Did you see that? That's what people do. Did you see that? Why are they so amazed? And it's really interesting why they're amazed. Did you see that? Look, over there. And that is what Allah shows you when you believe in the unseen. These fish that just kind of, did you see that? And if you spend enough time doing it, you don't do that anymore. You just say, SubhanAllah, <laughs> SubhanAllah. Really, I'm not making that up. I really, that is the reality of life. Once you open yourself up to belief, it just keeps confirming itself to you. That's how you increase in Iman, by just increasing in Iman. Because Allah gives you more to believe in. Have taqwa and Allah will keep teaching you more to have taqwa about. It's a real gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all of us. And that's why we should see it as a gift. And then some said, Hibl al-Amr wa tark al-Wizr. It's protecting the matter, which is your deen, and avoiding sin. Al-Ihtimam and Masaqat al-Balwa. Guarding oneself against those calamities that befall us and cause us to trip and stumble. And then he says, and our Shaykh, meaning Shaykh Abdullah al-Haddad radiallahu anhu said, Taqwa is imtithar awamri lahi ta'ala wujtinab maharimi zahiran wa batinan. So that's Ibn Asher's definition. And that's what's beautiful about our tradition, is that in Yemen it's the same tradition as it is in Morocco, as it is in Indonesia, as it is in Mauritania, as it is in Turkey, as it is in Bosnia. This is the same teaching and it's all from the same source which is the Qur'an and then our beloved Prophet Sallallahu And in reality, it's all from the Prophet Sallallahu because the Qur'an is from him. And then in reality, it's all from Allah because the Prophet Sallallahu is from Allah. And then in reality, it's all from whoever teaches you because that's the way it works. So behind everything in reality is Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala, but Allah has made means. 
And so acknowledging the means is part of what Allah demands. Man lam yashkuri nas lam yashkuri la. If you aren't grateful to people, you're not grateful to Allah. And so the greatest gratitude that we should have is to the Prophet ﷺ. Because in being grateful to him, we are grateful to Allah. And that's what Allah says. If you're not grateful to people, you haven't been grateful to Allah. And so the only important matter that must always be at the forefront is that you recognize that your gratitude to the Prophet ﷺ or to your teachers or to your mother and your father is in reality gratitude to Allah. There's no shirk because you don't, you're not veiled by the means. See, people in this world, the people of dunya, are veiled by the means. They think the means are the reality. So when they take the medicine, they think the medicine cured them. When they get their money at the end of the month, they think it was their job that fed them. No, we recognize the means are simply that. They are means. And in reality, behind the doctor is Allah. Behind the job is Allah. Behind the Prophet and Behind everything is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, in being grateful to everything, we are grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala including being grateful to people that harm us because in reality they're doing us a big favor in drawing us near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so it gets to the point where you begin to feel gratitude towards everything and that's the highest maqam and what does the shaitan say? and you won't find most of them in gratitude that's what he wants to take you away from and Allah says min shukur, how few of my servants are grateful so really it's gratitude that's at the root and taqwa is in essence gratitude. I mean, don't become immersed in all this fear. Huwa ahlu taqwa. Allah is ahlu taqwa. He is worthy of it. In other words, it's just he's worthy of it. Because if it's all about fear, then you end up becoming somebody who is doing things motivated out of a very low force in the world, which is fear. Fear is a low force. Fear is how these people rule everybody. That's how they put them all, you better do this or this is going to happen, get your insurance. Or Somebody sent me an ad and it was for insurance, life insurance. And it said, who's going to take care of your wife and children if you die? I said, Allah. That's my answer. They're asking me. And then they said, who's going to take care of your house payments and your this and your that if you die? I said, Allah. All the answers I had, Allah. And then I realized I didn't need the life insurance. <laughs> so why does that work with those people? It works because they don't have the right answer. When they say, who's going to take care of your wife and children when you die? What did Abu Bakr radiallahu when he gave all of his wealth to the Prophet, he said, Mada tarakta li ahlika. What did you leave for your family? He said, taraktu lahum Allah wa rasuluhu. I left them Allah and his messenger. And that's why he's who he is. That's his insurance policy. And aman, the word in modern Arabic for insurance, is the same root of iman. They're from the same root, isti'man. Yista'minu means to insure yourself. But it also means to seek aman. And iman is to make yourself safe. How? Billah. Not with blue cross or not with any cross. <laughs> So it goes on. This is a great subject, so I'm doing it. Barakallah fikum. Akramukum Allah, wazadukum Allah.